Uh, what I want to uh, discuss today and what was intended to discuss today from the standpoint of uh, Tracy and putting together the agenda, helping put together the agenda for this, is to talk a little bit more about lupus nephritis. As a lot of you probably know, there's been two recent uh, approvals for uh, treatment of lupus nephritis uh, just in the last few months. So I uh, want to try to bring this to everyone's attention again, because every time we get a new treatment, uh, we want to reach out to people to be sure that uh, these new treatments will hopefully uh, get into the hands of people who can most benefit from them. So uh, this was a slide deck that uh, I had helped in several other uh, physicians, uh, Arenia put together. There's the ones that have uh, funded this particular talk, one for patients and one targeting uh, physicians as well, just to go over what some of the unmet needs are in lupus nephritis, uh, as well as to help patients better understand uh, the importance of lupus nephritis, the importance of its early detection. And so this is what this uh, deck is going to focus on for the next 30 to 40 minutes. And then if there's some questions, we can take a few after that. Okay, that's me. I work here at UAB. I've been here for about 34 years, and for the last 20 years, I've directed the lupus clinic here. So we're going to talk about lupus nephritis, and uh, I don't have to tell the audience that lupus is a serious chronic disease, and it has a lot of complications, and what we know about lupus is that it does seem to be a disorder wherein uh, the immune system is a uh, basically starting to react with parts of uh, the body that are uh, part of yourself and not foreign invaders like the immune system optimally is supposed to do. Uh, inflammation caused by lupus can affect a lot of different parts of the body, almost every organ system, but the one that is most commonly affected uh, tends to be the kidneys. And when that happens, that's what's called lupus nephritis. And if you look at the natural history of lupus, if you follow lupus patients over the, the course of their life, it turns out that depending on how hard you look for it, up to about 50% of patients with lupus may have some features of lupus nephritis. Now, for a lot of those patients, it may not be clinically significant, but uh, our role is to find out and detect when it is clinically significant as early as possible so as to prevent long-term damage to the kidney. And that's what we're gonna focus uh, some of our discussion on this afternoon. Because what we want to prevent is long-term kidney failure. So inflammation is always gonna be associated with some permanent damage. So anytime you have, if you have lupus nephritis, anytime an episode of lupus nephritis occurs, uh, it is going to cause some permanent damage to the kidney. So the key is to either prevent that from ever occurring in the first place or detect it early when it happens so that the damage associated with that lupus nephritis flare is minimal. Kidneys are very important in our body because they help properly remove waste from the blood and control the amounts of fluids in the body. So if your kidneys aren't working well, uh, after some time, if the damage gets to be severe enough and is not treated, that can lead to, lead to fluid retention, as well as metabolic problems from the inability for the kidneys to properly remove waste from the body to the point where the patient uh, may end up having to go on dialysis. So that's an outcome that we, uh, you know, that's our goal, that patients with lupus nephritis should never have to go on dialysis. So who is primarily affected by lupus nephritis? Uh, we know that there's at least 100,000 people in the U.S. currently diagnosed and living with lupus nephritis, and that's about, on average, one in three patients with lupus at any given time is going to have some manifestation of lupus nephritis. Uh, that may be very mild, where it doesn't really require a lot of aggressive immune suppressive treatment, or it may be more significant, where we need to intervene to prevent damage to the kidney. Compared to uh, Caucasian people, we know that the prevalence of lupus nephritis is roughly about four times higher for people of African and Asian descent. And we know that uh, it's also twice as high in patients who are Caucasian who are of Hispanic descent, 
and also among Native American peoples, it's about the risk is about twice higher than it is for European Caucasians. Now, lupus nephritis is going to be more common in women, uh, as is lupus being more common in women. However, uh, when males who develop lupus nephritis get lupus nephritis, it's often more severe than it is in women. So most males that we see with lupus nephritis do tend to have the more severe variants of the disease. It can be more difficult to treat. So it's not only important to detect in women who are most commonly affected with lupus, but males with lupus is particularly important to detect it early because when it starts, it can be much more severe. Okay, so what are the signs and symptoms of lupus nephritis? Well, the signs we know. Unfortunately, the symptoms, once they develop, indicate that the lupus nephritis has gone a lot further than we would have wanted it to. Um, but the way we can detect lupus nephritis earliest and the quickest, and ideally, is to detect that there's evidence of leakage of protein into the urine, which is what we call proteinuria. This is why every lupus patient, when they come for their visits, we often will check a urinalysis because we're looking for early evidence of lupus nephritis. Uh, you know, most patients that have lupus nephritis, probably the majority of them had the lupus nephritis at the time they were diagnosed with lupus. Uh, if you've had established lupus for more than two to three years and you have not developed lupus nephritis, the likelihood of that is that you're going to get lupus nephritis is, is small. Nonetheless, we still look out for it. So in that particular group of patients, we will want to check the urine at least once or twice a year. For patients with newly diagnosed lupus, uh, within the first two years of diagnosis, we usually like to check the urine a little bit more frequently, at least every four months, because those first two years sometimes, although it may not be readily apparent when they first come in for diagnoses, uh, those manifestations might develop over the first or second year. And so we're a little bit more compulsive about checking the urine more frequently. The other thing that can happen is that blood can leak into the urine. Uh, that's what we call hematuria. So not only are we looking for protein, we're also looking for blood in the urine that's, that's otherwise not explained. If you're a woman and you have to be around your menstrual period, that might be an explanation for it, in which case we would ask you to repeat the urine at a time you're not on menses. Uh, if you have a history of kidney stones, that can certainly cause blood in the urine. Uh, so uh, if we have otherwise unexplained blood in the urine, that's a concern for lupus nephritis as well. As the lupus nephritis gets more progressive, uh, there can be changes in some of the blood tests that we measure, such as the creatinine level, which is a determinant of how well your kidney is filtering the blood, which is what's referred to as the glomerular filtration rate or GFR. You may see this estimated on some of your lab reports that come in. So the estimated GFR is a number that's generated based upon what your blood creatinine level is, your age and your sex. Normally the creatinine clearance or GFR should be in excess of 60. If it falls below that, then there's evidence that you may be starting to develop some form of chronic kidney disease, either from lupus nephritis or perhaps hypertension or some other cause. Uh, abnormal electrolyte levels uh, with severe kidney impairment, sometimes the kidneys will start having trouble excreting sufficient potassium. So you may see elevations in the potassium level. Uh, if your kidneys are having difficulty excreting fluids, uh, sometimes that can cause dilution of the salt or sodium level in your blood may start to go down. Uh, increasing blood pressure can be a tip off that lupus nephritis may be developing. So we always check blood pressures when you come to the clinic, but if you're finding that your blood pressure readings are starting to be a bit more high than what they've been accustomed to, if you go into the drugstore or grocery store and have it checked or have a home monitor, that should prompt an assessment to see whether you may be developing lupus nephritis. So if your blood pressure readings are starting to trend up, it'd be good to come in and get a urine protein test because uh, that's going to be the first thing that's going to show abnormality is, is, is protein in the urine if the blood pressure elevation is due to lupus nephritis. And then finally, there are assessments we can do by biopsying the kidney. Uh, that's what we do to, to confirm whether there is actually lupus nephritis in the kidney. 
but uh, obviously we don't do biopsies on everybody. So we use these other parameters that are much less invasive to determine whether lupus nephritis is likely developing. But if you start getting swelling in your feet and ankles, that means things have moved along pretty far. Uh, definitely this would merit an assessment for the possibility of lupus nephritis. Uh, weight gain that's related to fluid would be another uh, light, relatively light symptom when this has really gotten established. Uh, urination at night or what's called nocturia can be a symptom of lupus nephritis, again, due to the excess fluid retention. And when protein is present in your urine, it can cause it to be foamy and bubbly. So that's one thing that you might uh, want to bring to the attention of who's following you for your lupus if you're starting to notice that your urine is a bit more frothy uh, in the toilet bowl, then uh, that might be a good time to uh, notify your provider of this. And they may, they, they appropriately would ask you to come in and let us check the urine protein. Uh, so complications related to lupus nephritis uh, can also cause increased blood pressure. We touched on that. Uh, chronic kidney disease. Now, as I said, with recurrent inflammation attacks, that's usually going to be associated with some form of permanent damage to the kidney. Uh, and the sooner we intervene, you know, the less damage is going to occur with that particular uh, attack of inflammation. But as kidney function decline, uh, other things can occur other than just the things we talked about with the uh, blood chemistry changes. Your kidneys make hormones that tell your bone marrow to make lots of red blood cells. So anemia can start to develop with chronic kidney disease. And you can just feel fatigued and you can lose appetite due to the buildup of toxins in your body that the kidneys aren't appropriately excreting. We know that lupus nephritis is also very intimately associated with increasing cardiovascular complications. So if you have lupus nephritis, your risk for getting cardiovascular complications is definitely increased. We know that patients with lupus nephritis have a higher incidence of coronary artery disease. They also have a higher incidence of stroke. Now this may tie in to the elevated blood pressures that often accompany lupus nephritis, but be that as it may, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease is part and parcel of having lupus nephritis. And it's uh, another reason that we try to prevent progression of this. And what we don't want to have happen is for patients to go into kidney failure where they have to go on dialysis. And this is what's termed end-stage renal disease or ESRD. So bottom line is at the bottom of the slide, we want to catch this early because uh, we do have uh, fairly effective treatments now that can help prevent irreversible kidney damage. So how do we get this diagnosed? What's the uh, pathway to getting diagnosed with lupus nephritis? Uh, generally, this is going to be confirmed in the context of either seeing the rheumatologist and or nephrologist. Uh, both specialists are facile at diagnosing lupus nephritis. Uh, a lot of the patients are diagnosed by the rheumatologist because it's just part of the uh, evaluation for lupus when you come in to see us is we want to know whether or not you have lupus nephritis and if we're following you. Uh, it, we want to be sure that uh, if you're developing it, that we catch it early. Uh, some patients may come to this diagnosis through the nephrologist. They may have hypertension that was otherwise unexplained, and it's determined that the patient has lupus and due to kidney disease or complications from that. Some patients may get referred to the nephrologist because there's protein in the urine that their family practitioner has seen. And in the process of evaluating why that's occurring, it's determined that the patient has lupus. So um, uh, nephrologists also perform kidney biopsies, but nowadays a lot of kidney biopsies are also done by interventional radiologists. So uh, a lot of the patients that come to us in rheumatology, when we suspect this, if the nephrologist isn't really available to do this, we can usually get the biopsies done more quickly by just uh, scheduling this by one of the interventional radiologists that may be in practice at the local hospital. So, but uh, there's different people that can do these biopsies now. And that's good because we want to get to the diagnosis as quickly as possible. And usually we'll take the path of least resistance to get the biopsy done the quickest. We've talked about the urine test and the importance of that to detecting if there's problems with your kidneys functioning in terms of detecting the proteinuria and whether there's blood in the urine. Uh, 
So routine urine testing is really vital to uncovering problems that can lead to more serious outcomes. So this is why we do this. Uh, the blood test, including the blood creatinine level, uh, we've talked about that. That's a measure of how well your kidneys are filtering the blood. And then finally, uh, almost all patients with lupus nephritis, if this is suspected, we do want to get a kidney biopsy. And there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, you say, well, if you have hypertension and blood and urine and protein and you know you have lupus, uh, why is it necessary to get a kidney biopsy? Well, other things can sometimes cause blood in the urine and protein in the urine. And it's important to confirm if nephritis is what's causing that, uh, even though we know you have lupus. The other reason a kidney biopsy is helpful is it tells us the severity of the inflammation. So as we'll talk about in a minute, there are several different types of lupus nephritis. They're probably managed a little bit differently depending upon the pattern of inflammation in the kidney and, and what we call the class of nephritis that's present uh, after reviewing uh, the biopsy of the kidney. Okay. So these are the different classes of lupus nephritis that I was just referring to. Um, and those are shown here. There's six different types and I'll just discuss each of those briefly. Class one nephritis is when there's very minimal kidney involvement. So this is a patient you may have a little bit of proteinuria but more than we feel comfortable just watching. We'll do a biopsy and what we'll see is what's called minimal mesangial disease. So the mesangium in the kidney is kind of the uh, space between where the filtering blood vessels are and where the organelles of the kidney that collect the urine are. So there's an interface between those two uh, plumbing inlets and outlets, if you will, and that's called the mesangium. So if there's just evidence of some immune deposits in the mesangium, but no signs of the blood capillaries proliferating and no signs of big immune deposits where the urine uh, collecting system interfaces with that, that would be called minimal kidney involvement with mesangial disease. And a lot of times we'll just observe that. If there's some significant proteinuria, we may put you on a blood pressure medication that can tend to decrease the amount of protein that develops. Those are called ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Um, and similarly, that's the way we would approach mesangial proliferative disease. So if we see extra cells coming into that mesangial space, that's what we would call class two nephritis. So there's starting to be a little bit more inflammation in the kidney, but probably not so much that we would put, you, uh, put that patient on immune suppressive therapy. Again, we might just put on medication to cut down on some of the excess protein that's being lost. The forms of nephritis we worry the most about are class three and class four, because in these forms of nephritis, what's happening is that the blood vessels that form the little capillary filters in the kidney, uh, the cells around the walls of those blood vessels are starting to proliferate. And when they do that, they start to block the flow of blood into the kidney filtering system. And so if less than half of that network of blood vessels involved, we call that focal glomerulonephritis or class three. But if more than half of them are involved or if they're starting to show proliferation of cells around the capsule of the glomerulus, that's what we call class four diffuse proliferative nephritis. And this is where we need to intervene quickly with, uh, initially with steroids to try to suppress the inflammation as quickly as possible, as well as institute what's, what we refer to as steroid sparing immunosuppressive therapy, medications such as mycophenolate, azathioprine, uh, some of the calcineurin inhibitors, uh, including the new drug that's available now, voclosporin, is in that class. Or in severe cases, we might recommend low doses of chemotherapy if the patient can't tolerate oral meds to try to get this under control much more quickly. Uh, membranous glomerulonephritis uh, is that's a, a lesion where there's not these proliferative changes we see in class three and class four where there's just immune deposits around the network of blood vessels where it interfaces with the uh, urine collecting system. But those immune deposits can cause changes in that interface of what we call the basement membrane. And it can cause lots of protein to leak out of the blood into the urine. Um, these patients tend to have the greatest degrees of protein loss in the urine. And this, this particular lesion can actually be more difficult to treat than the class three or class four, although it tends not to be one that leads to significant chronic kidney disease. 
Now, there can be some overlap in these various classes. For instance, there can be patients that might have class five membranous disease that may subsequently develop some proliferative changes. And we call that transformation of the nephritis to a more aggressive form. So if we see an increase in the proteinuria or start to see blood in the urine or a uh, decrease in the uh, filtration rate or an increase in the blood creatinine that would indicate that, that's a tip off that there may be this transformation to a more severe uh, lesion in the kidney. And that's when we would probably go ahead and, and arrange a second biopsy to see if that's what's going on. Finally, there's class six where there's, this is a more advanced lesion where the disease isn't so active. There's just been a lot of scarring in the kidney and that's really all that's there. And you're left just with this chronic kidney damage, perhaps with some ongoing protein leak, but there's nothing going on in there that we're gonna be able to improve with immunosuppressive therapy. So another reason to get a kidney biopsy is to be sure that we're not just dealing with this advanced class six lesion where there's just scarring and immune suppressive therapy is not gonna really help that. And there's no reason to subject the patient to the risks of that uh, if, that's, if that's all that's going on. So a little bit of a complicated pathology lesson there, but just to give you some insight into the nomenclature and names we have, uh, give to these various classes. So maybe you have a better appreciation uh, for that should you end up with this particular complication. So how do we manage lupus nephritis now that's been diagnosed? Uh, so this uh, requires really and optimally a combination of things. Uh, certainly uh, you need to educate yourself about lupus nephritis and work with different healthcare providers that can advise you about how to deal with this, whether it's with a nephrologist, whether it's with your rheumatologist, whether it's with a dietitian uh, to help you make the necessary dietary modifications that may help this long-term, all of that's gonna be important, as well as educating yourself about lupus nephritis, how it's treated, how the medications can work, what the medication side effects can be, and the importance of complying with the medication. Um, diet and exercise are gonna be important. We know that patients with lupus in general and lupus nephritis in particular will do better if they have a body mass index that's closer to 25 than 45. Uh, that definitely can affect the long-term outcome. Uh, and just good healthy living habits, getting good rest, getting proper exercise. Uh, all of these things can improve outcomes in lupus, including lupus nephritis. So when this complication sets in, uh, working with the various providers that can help is important. So uh, if you've got skin disease, certainly there's a correlation in a lot of patients between uh, lupus nephritis and certain forms of uh, lupus compli skin complications. Dermatologists may be involved. Uh, if you've got some neurologic complications due to the renal failure, because uh, it can sometimes be associated with neuropathy and neurologists may be involved. We talked about the association of lupus nephritis with vascular disease, so cardiologists may well be involved. The pathologist helps us out in terms of classifying the nephritis. The radiologists may be involved in obtaining the biopsies. Pharmacists are involved helping you get access to medication and teaching you about the medications. Physical therapists may be involved in helping you uh, get into some of those healthy exercise habits. So this really is optimally a team approach. So how can you best work with your healthcare team? Uh, you just had a, an hour lecture on this, so I'm not going, or a presentation on this, so I don't, don't have to go over too much of this, but um, just, again, just you being your best self-advocate can be done by just doing some simple things. And this, they're kind of enumerated here. Keep track of your medical appointments and visits so that those aren't missed because those are important. Uh, keep a diary of your symptoms that you can refer to during the uh, visits with us, whether it's by telehealth or within the clinic. That certainly makes for a productive visit. Um, if you've had recent blood uh, tests done, particularly if it's outside the system where your provider may be practicing, uh, keeping those in a binder and bringing those with you can sometimes be very helpful and save time 
uh, if we need to go over trends and some of what uh, and have some of your blood work has been doing, if we don't have access to those in our own electronic record when you're coming to see us. Um, keeping an updated list of your medications is very important um, just because we all need to be on the same page as to what you're taking. And uh, uh, prior to the uh, pandemic, it was also always a good idea to take a friend or family and to you with to your appointment to just help you remember things. Those were usually welcome. Uh, you know, additions to the encounter from the provider standpoint, because we do want you to remember what we talk about. Uh, but in the days of COVID, there's some restrictions on that. So that's not always feasible. However, a lot of times patients will just dial up their family member and will be on speakerphone. So that's the best way to handle that. Uh, until we get out of the pandemic mess. So, uh, you know, having another person listen in on this is, is certainly acceptable. And bring your question list. Um, I always start my encounter by asking the patient, uh, what do you want to talk about? And so that's when you can pull out the question list and we be sure we cover everything on the front end that you need to talk about or are concerned about. Uh, we just alluded a little bit to telemedicine. Again, those same principles uh, apply. Just, uh, you know, it's important to have a reliable phone or internet connection. Um, if it's going to be a true video telehealth visit, uh, wearing clothing that you can show us where that rash is or where that edema is or arthritis is, uh, these aren't things necessarily relevant to lupus nephritis, but it's just a good principle to follow if you're going to do a visit by telehealth so we can assess all that we need to uh, with your phone camera. You need to be able to uh, easily show that to us without having to go change clothes. If you can, just having checked your blood pressure, pulse, and temperature that day is good. Um, if you have lupus nephritis, uh, we really advocate that patients have a home blood pressure cuff because uh, and I'll just, I'm gonna say this right now, the, um, you know, treating the lupus nephritis with the medicines we use to do that now is only half the battle. Uh, we lose, patients lose kidney function 50% of the time, not because their lupus nephritis inflammation isn't adequately treated, but because blood pressure is not adequately treated. So it's very critical for managing lupus nephritis to keep blood pressure under control. And therefore it's very important that patients, once they're diagnosed with nephritis, uh, do make the investment in getting a blood pressure cuff and how to measure their blood pressure at home and to keep a log on that. Because if the thresholds consistently exceed readings of 140 over 90, we know that that can be associated with acceleration of chronic kidney disease just from the hypertension alone even though we've adequately treated the inflammation in the kidney. So uh, blood pressure checks are important. It's good to keep a log of those if you have lupus nephritis that you can review with us at visits. So that segues into the commonly used treatments for lupus nephritis. Uh, it says at the top, there are currently no medications approved by the FDA for lupus nephritis. Uh, this slide deck was put together in early fall of last year. And since then, there are actually two now treatments now that have indications for helping managing treatment of lupus nephritis. And these fall in the class of immunosuppressants. So these are used to treat the more aggressive or severe forms of lupus nephritis, like I was talking about earlier, these class three or class four lesions where there's proliferation of the blood vessels in the kidney or the membranous nephritis where there's substantial loss of protein. <clears throat> now these uh, therapies work through different mechanisms. Commonly, we use medications that decrease the proliferation of immune cells, particularly lymphocytes. And mycophenolate or mycophenolic acid specifically targets lymphocytes, and that's why it's probably one of the more common immunosuppressants used to treat lupus nephritis. Cytoxan and azathioprine are other immunosuppressants that have a more broad effect on suppressing proliferation of immune cells. Those may be used in patients that can't tolerate mycophenolate or in patients for whom uh, oral medication is not a good option if they've got some intercurrent GI complications and they need intravenous treatment. At least initially, we'll give them low doses of cytoxan chemotherapy. The newer treatments involve 
a class of medications called calcineurin inhibitors. And these are medications that decrease the function of T lymphocytes in the immune system. They work pretty quickly. There were some classic ones used more commonly to help prevent uh, organ transplant rejection. These were medications like cyclosporin or tacrolimus were the two original calcineurin inhibitors. There's now a new one now specifically approved for treatment of lupus nephritis called voclosporin. Uh, there may be some advantages to voclosporin in that it's a little bit easier to dose. You don't have to follow blood levels so much as you do with the other two. But that's now one of the approved treatments. The other approved treatment now for lupus nephritis works a little bit differently and it's more for helping uh, lupus nephritis stay in remission. And that's the use of Benlista. We know it's been around now for 10 years uh, available uh, to prescribe for lupus is when it was approved about 10 years ago. Uh, originally, it really wasn't intended to use this to treat lupus nephritis because it's a very slow acting drug in terms of how it, it uh, accrues benefits in lupus. But there was a recent study done where they uh, looked at patients that were on traditional treatment for lupus nephritis that were also given the lumimab. And uh, what was noted in that study is at two years, the uh, percentages of patients that were able to stay in complete remission was much better in the patients that got Benlista than those that did not. So uh, in terms of helping keep lupus nephritis in remission and keep and uh, able to have a uh, outcome such that there's not as much activity two years out, uh, use of belimumab seems to give some benefit there. The calcineurin inhibitors are probably more helpful in the early stages of the disease, getting the proteinuria down much more quickly when added to mycophenolate. And that's primarily how voclosporin is going to be used going forward. Uh, steroids are used initially to quickly reduce and control inflammation in the kidneys. They have very uh, uh, broad effects on inflammation, uh, but they also have very broad side effects. So we don't want patients to have to stay on steroids for very long. And with some of these newer therapies, actually we can get patients off of significant courses of steroids within four to six weeks. Whereas, you know, in years past, we'd have to leave patients on moderate doses of steroids for the nephritis for three to four months. I think with some of these newer approaches, we can really shorten that high dose steroid exposure time significantly to avoid complications such as significant weight gain, diabetes, effects on mood, and effects on your bones and joints. We talked about the importance of blood pressure control. So any number of those may be used to help maintain lower blood pressures because we know if we keep the blood pressure under good control, that can slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. And we also leave patients on antimalarial therapy. That's part of the uh, medications such as hydroxychloroquine is important in the treatment of lupus nephritis as it is important in the treatment of uh, lupus in general. The other advantage that an of antimalarials used long-term is they do decrease the uh, risk and occurrence of cardiovascular complications of lupus. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, patients with lupus nephritis tend to be at significant increased risk for premature cardiovascular disease. And we know that antimalarials in lupus patients can help uh, mitigate or decrease the risk of that occurring. Beyond medications, what do you need to do if you have lupus nephritis? You need to be careful about your diet. Uh, dietitians are part of the routine uh, consultations that we try to uh, uh, set up for patients if they start to develop chronic kidney disease. You need to be careful about foods that have lots of salt. So um, low salt diets are important in this uh, management. Processed foods tend to have high amounts of salt as well as sugar, so eating more fresh foods will certainly help you with that. Um, with advanced kidney disease, you've got to be careful about eating too much protein, so small portions of protein-rich foods may need to come into play with more advanced stages of chronic kidney disease, and the dietitians can give guidance to that uh, in the setting of your chronic kidney disease management. In heart healthy foods, for the reasons we alluded to earlier with the premature cardiovascular disease, uh, 
you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and their antioxidants that are in those may be important in help, uh, helping to prevent uh, premature cardiovascular disease. Uh, exercise in the routine can have a lot of benefits, both emotionally and physically. Uh, we encourage low impact activities, primarily swimming, walking, yoga, an elliptical machine or exercise bike. Uh, these are all very good things to do as part of your routine. Obviously, it's important to discuss what exercise forms may be best for you in the context of any joint complications you may have with the lupus or in the context of any significant cardiac or lung disease. So remember, you are your own best advocate. Uh, two of the speakers now have emphasized that for you. So try to stay engaged. Uh, you know, learn about lupus nephritis and ask your healthcare providers to help you with this. Understand your risk. You know, about 50% of patients with lupus over time may go on to develop some form of lupus nephritis. Uh, before those physical symptoms begin, uh, just be sure you follow through with the routine urine testing and talk to your physician about what the results mean. You know, we don't want to diagnose lupus nephritis when you come in with swollen feet and legs and have lost your appetite. Uh, that means the chronic kidney disease is pretty well established and we, that's not when we want to see you for this problem. We will see you for the problem, but we'd like to see you before that happens. <laughs> There's no one size fits all treatment. Uh, treatment is best individualized based on what your other disease complications may be and what type of uh, kidney lesion you may have uh, that we need to address. And keep continuing to keep yourself educated. I can tell you that there are lots of new therapies coming out now, likely, that are going to in continue to incrementally increase our ability to treat lupus nephritis so that we can you know, improve our success rate at preventing uh, chronic kidney disease long-term. Uh, I think before these last two therapies were approved, uh, you know, our success rate in, in getting patients into remission with lupus nephritis was abysmal. It's like 15% um, of patients with lupus nephritis over time have a sustained remission in their disease. These newer treatments, I think, will probably be able to double that, uh, but that's still not great. Uh, when a third of patients may still go on and develop significant chronic kidney disease over time, uh, you know, we need to improve on that. And there's other treatments and trials that may help us well do that. So continue to keep yourself educated about what's out there and what uh, interventions are out there to help uh, you best preserve kidney function if you're diagnosed with lupus nephritis. There's some resources that have been made available uh, by Arenia that I'll just leave here for you to copy down if you need to, um, or Tracy can provide them. They have a website that you can log on to uh, that has a lot of good educational material, as does the Lupus Foundation at lupus.org. Uh, there's an all in Facebook page for this now, as well as a uh, lupus nephritis awareness kit that uh, you can uh, request that can be sent to you with some resources summarized like we've talked about today. With that, I will thank you for your attention and be glad to take a few questions if Tracy wants to uh, pass those on. I will be your um, moderator. We, we have a couple, a couple of things, things in the, in the chat. chat. Well, one I can pull up here, um, somebody with stage four lupus nephritis or either two new meds effective at this stage or they're recommended for early stages. So uh, yes and no in terms of uh, whether they would apply to someone with, um, now stage four chronic kidney disease is fairly advanced. So if we're talking about that and not class four lupus nephritis, uh, that's a different question. But if you've got fairly advanced chronic kidney disease from lupus nephritis, those treatments probably are not going to be significantly impactful for patients with advanced disease or really are most useful in patients uh, that have just recently been diagnosed with new onset lupus nephritis or 
a flare of existing lupus nephritis that may not be quite as advanced as stage four diseases. So um, if a patient, even with fairly advanced chronic kidney disease, show signs that they may be having another flare of their disease, and we do a biopsy of that patient and determine that there's active nephritis and not just scarring, uh, then these treatments might be used. Um, again, the calcineurin inhibitors like baclosporin uh, would be used to help get the uh, acute flare under control more quickly in combination with something like mycophenolate or azathioprine. Uh, if there's uh, evidence of ongoing what we call serologic activity, where complement levels are low and you know, the lupus is definitely active systemically, then uh, belimumab might help maintain uh, better disease control in the long run. Uh, belimumab or benlist is not gonna help in acute flare of nephritis. It's just it will help patients that have had flares uh, get into remission and stay in remission a little bit better than not being on it. Are you, Are you able, able to see the chat? chat? No. Okay. I okay. saw the Q and A, but I can't see the chat box. Okay. Well, hold on hold one on second. second. Apparently, Apparently, I'm, I'm echoing. echoing. Okay. Well, maybe I can get to the chat now. Here. Yeah, I found it now. Okay. So, has been list of preventive or treatment. Um, it is, it's both. Uh, I mean, Benlista can help you get into remission over time a little bit better than not being on it. But really what Benlista does, it decreases the frequency and severity of lupus flares is the best way to think about that. So um, yes, it, it, in fact, the way that Benlista was thought about being looked at in lupus nephritis is in the original trials, they looked at patients that had come in, the original Benlista trials, they looked at patients that had uh, had previous lupus nephritis. And although the numbers weren't large enough to make a definitive conclusion, it was observed that patients in the Benlista arm uh, had fewer relapses of the nephritis in the course of the trial. So uh, that certainly uh, begged the question as to whether Benlista might actually you know, have a role in managing lupus nephritis in that regard. So it required a separate trial recruiting a lot of patients with that situation to be able to show that. And that trial resulted last year and the results were published in a, in a journal back in September with that result. Um, rituximab can help get the nephritis under control more quickly, uh, but there's, you know, been some studies using uh, been listed in combination with rituximab that uh, I know there's at least one study with that in, 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 in general lupus that should be reporting out sometime later this year. But specifically in lupus nephritis, now that we know that been listed clearly has evidence that it can prevent relapses and, and have a greater likelihood of uh, keeping patients in a remission, at least at two years, there's probably a little bit more rationale to use that now. And I, I think uh, physicians may be uh, starting to prescribe this a little bit more frequently in patients with lupus nephritis. Question as to whether menopause will make lupus uh, less flare or less, or in, in, uh, well, how does menopause affect lupus, I guess would be the question. Um, clearly there's some patients for whom high levels of estrogen can make the disease worse. And for some patients, once they get menopausal, their disease activity may actually improve. So uh, the answer to that question would be yes, it can decrease the frequency and severity of the lupus manifestations. And a lot of patients find that, that their disease may well remit once they go through menopause. Okay, I'm working backwards here. I'm gonna go back up to the top. Um, quick COVID update. Um, yeah, I guess I, I can say two things about that. Um, I think uh, I'd encourage all lupus patients to get immunized against COVID. There's no evidence right now that patients with lupus are having increased issues with the vaccine. Um, I'm personally not seeing that, and I've seen that reported in the um, uh, 
formal way where that's been uh, looked at in a study that's reportable at this point. So uh, lupus patients that have gotten vaccinated kind of have the same symptoms that everybody else without lupus has uh, that we see in a rheumatology clinic. So uh, I would not hesitate to get vaccinated for COVID because you have lupus. Um, just as we encourage patients with lupus to get influenza vaccine because we know that influenza infections can trigger nasty lupus flares. The same is true as of COVID. And uh, I could encourage people to get vaccinated as soon as it becomes available to you. And I would get the one that, that you can get access to the quickest. Um, I wouldn't wait for one vaccine over the other. Um, Does lupus nephritis progress from class one to class four? Yes, so that can certainly happen. Um, that's why we, if you're diagnosed with lupus nephritis, we tell patients for the rest of their days, they should never go more than four months without getting their urine checked because um, certainly uh, the, the class can progress from fairly benign disease into a more proliferative lesion. Now, once you're on treatment for lupus, the likelihood of that goes down, but it can still happen. And that's why regardless of you being on treatment, regardless if you've already you know, been diagnosed with lupus for three or four years without lupus nephritis, we still look for it. Can a patient have class three and four or five from the start? Yes, a lot of patients get diagnosed with lupus because they come in with lupus nephritis and that's all they have. So uh, the answer to both of those questions would be yes. Can lupus nephritis come out of a sudden from an infection? So I guess the question would be, can an infection trigger a flare of lupus nephritis? And the answer I would say is yes, because we know that infections can trigger lupus flares and lupus nephritis can certainly be part of that flare. Um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to distinguish some infections that affect the bloodstream. Um, because how that shows up in the kidney can mimic lupus nephritis. Um, we've certainly had difficult cases where patients with existing lupus got, say, an infection on their heart valve where they had endocarditis from a bacterial infection. And if you look at what happens as a kidney complication of that, that can look identical to lupus nephritis. And we can't tell the difference between the two. So uh, we just treat you for both. So, but. The answer to your question is, yeah, lupus nephritis can be triggered by an infection, as can any kind of lupus flare. Uh, is there a way for lupus patients to avoid getting lupus nephritis? Um, I would say probably not, other than that if you're diagnosed with lupus, just try to comply with your treatment. Because we know that, for instance, uh, just with, if hydroxychloroquine is the only treatment that you're on, we know that patients, if they can stay on that and comply with it, uh, their likelihood of developing other organ complications is less than uh, patients who do not comply with the medication. So um, the way you can prevent other, not just lupus nephritis, but any lupus complication over time is to stay on the prescribed uh, preventive medications, which I would put hydroxychloroquine in that bucket. And uh, concentrate on keeping your general health good. Um, you know, getting your body mass index down to 25, uh, that will help with the long-term management of lupus. Your disease will do better over time. So uh, doing the dietary and exercise habits that will uh, facilitate that is something you have control over and something you can do. I think that and taking the medication is the uh, most important thing you can do to prevent nephritis flares or lupus flares in general. Uh, again, you know, what can trigger nephritis flares? So, uh, I, you know, infections can trigger lupus flares and nephritis can be part of a lupus flare. So um, again, the importance of getting immunized against getting severe viral infections is important in prevention. Um, and, uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's hard to keep ourselves from getting infected with any virus. Although <laughs> one beneficial effect of the COVID pandemic is we see a lot less colds and flu. And it's just because, you know, hopefully most people are wearing masks and keeping their hands clean. So transmission of a lot of other viruses has gone down substantially in the last year. So uh, I don't know if that's translated in the fewer lupus flares or not. It would be an interesting population study to, to look into that. That's a good question. All right. And I think I got down to where we were before. So let me see if there's something at the end here. Sure. Uh, drug-induced lupus nephritis. Um, yeah, drug-induced lupus typically uh, does not occur uh, in terms of it causing nephritis flares. Most drug-induced lupus symptoms tend to be skin rashes, maybe some pleuritis or pericarditis, fevers and skin rashes and joint symptoms tend to be the predominant features of that. You don't see too much lupus nephritis in the setting of drug-induced lupus. Now, the one exception to that, uh, one of the drug reactions to hydralazine, um, which we know can cause uh, drug-induced lupus, sometimes that drug can also trigger uh, a form of kidney inflammation that's related to what we call anca vasculitis. So uh, if that is present, then sometimes uh, that's the situation where there might be some confusion as to whether this is drug-induced lupus or from the hydralazine causing nephritis, which would be rare, or if it's more a case of hydralazine-induced vasculitis with the, uh, like we see in patients that have uh, anti- neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies or ANCA tests. So by and large, drug-induced lupus tends not to cause kidney disease. Um, lupus and life expectancy. Um, is it possible to have a normal life expectancy if it's well-controlled? Yes. Uh, patients with uh, mild lupus, by and large, if they take care of themselves and take anti-malarials, uh, they can expect to have a relatively normal life expectancy. I mean, what we observe in population studies over time is if, if you have lupus with significant internal organ involvement, whether it be nephritis or lung disease uh, or uh, vascular disease, uh, on average, that takes about 10 years off life expectancy. Now that's just on average. Certainly if it's caught early, and patients do all the things that they can do to get healthy in terms of losing weight, adherence to medication and so forth. Uh, you know, you may not fall down into that, you know, into that category where your life expectancy is gonna go down. But uh, so it, it varies. It depends upon what complications you have. It depends upon how severe the disease is. It depends upon compliance and adherence to treatment programs. So, uh, it, it does have the potential to knock years off your life. And it's usually as a result of these cardiovascular complications. So uh, doing the things to maintain good cardiovascular health is probably what's most important uh, in, in uh, trying to mitigate that risk of a, a lower life expectancy. It's keeping the blood pressure under control, eating well, exercising well, uh, getting treatment for you know, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, and those sorts of things. Uh, infections uh, tend to not be the major cause of mortality in lupus. It tends to be these premature cardiovascular complications. We worry about infections because, you know, it's not an insect, it can contribute to premature mortality, but uh, if we're smart about minimizing steroid exposure, that will help mitigate that risk substantially. Um, and a lot of the newer lupus treatments are much more focused and not so broadly, much more targeted and not so broadly suppressive to the immune system. But I think that, uh, you know, as time goes forward, uh, the treatments are much more targeted, much less broadly immune suppressive. We see a lot less infection related complications. If you've had a kidney transplant, is it likely the new kidney can go bad as well? Is there anything you can do to prevent that? Uh, 
besides taking your anti-rejection meds. So transplants go bad because there's rejection. So certainly uh, taking anti-rejection anti medication regularly is important. They can go bad if you get certain viral infections in the kidney, like BK virus, in which case you have to back off the immune suppression a little bit. And it can go bad because there can be recurrent lupus nephritis in the kidney. Uh, that doesn't happen very often because the transplant rejection meds are pretty good about keeping that from happening. But where we see this is in patients that have recently lost their kidney function due to lupus nephritis, and they get transplanted before the lupus was completely under control. And that's why a lot of transplant centers uh, ask us to get involved because they want to be sure that lupus is under control before they put the patient on a transplant list. Um, so we do everything we can to be sure there's no serologic activity. We sometimes will escalate the treatment more than we would otherwise to try to position the patient to get transplanted. So sometimes we'll go ahead and put them on some of the medications that are going to be used for transplant anyway to get the disease quieted down. Uh, sometimes we'll add Benlista or give them rituximab if we can't get the disease under control uh, to get them suitable for a, a transplant. So it's important to get the disease under control before you get the transplant because that cuts down on the likelihood of nephritis relapse post-transplant. All right, I'm at the bottom of the list. Any You've got uh, two, uh, two more in Q&A. &A. Oh, I've got to go back to Q&A, okay. All right, mention reducing the amount of protein in your diet. Uh, how much water should you consume? Um, you know, it doesn't help to keep yourself really well hydrated unless the nephrologist or dietitian working with the nephrologist has advised you that you need to limit your fluid intake. Generally, drinking lots of fluids is good because you want to, uh, you know, keep the um, you want to keep your blood from getting too concentrated in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So uh, I would say, you know, people advocate drinking eight, six ounce glasses of water a day at a minimum. Um, I think that's fine unless if it's been noted that your sodium levels are getting too low, then they might tell you to put the brakes on that a little bit. If the serum sodium starts drifting below 130, you may be drinking too much free water. But other than that, I think, uh, you know, have at it with the water bottle. Do differences in lupus nephritis incidents in different races, is it independent of socioeconomic status? Um, yes and no. Um, if you're of African descent, you do carry genes that can make lupus nephritis worse. Uh, no question, and that's been shown. There's a study done here where they found the gene that's associated with that. Um, so uh, it's there are racial factors that are independent of socioeconomic status that make lupus nephritis worse. There certainly are. Um, now, does socioeconomic status play into this? It does. Um, we know that patients of lower socioeconomic status have greater challenges with uh, medication adherence and adherence to appointments. Um, so that's a factor, but um, there, it's not the only factor. There's, no, there's not a big interaction here. I mean, there are clearly racial genetic factors that drive the severity of lupus nephritis in patients with African as well as Asian descent. That's, uh, and that can be in the, that's independent of what their socioeconomic status is. All right, anything else? All right, everybody have a great afternoon.